So uh, welcome everyone, a good morning, a good day, good evening, depends where you are uh, at, um, to the first uh, invited presentation, or the first actually presentation of, of the Interpol conference. Uh, it is a great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Hadi Haji Beghi uh, from, the, uh, from uh, Delft University of Technology, um, who will deliver the first um, invited talk. There are two talks in parallel. Uh, Hadi is delivering one of them. Uh, he will speak uh, uh, about his multi-scale experimental numerical approach when studying underground, uh, underground hydrogen storage. Um, next, please. So uh, just uh, to introduce Hadi, although uh, I think he needs not, not much of an introduction, but uh, Hadi is, um, because he's very well known, uh, Hadi, he has uh, received his master uh, at Sharif University of Technology uh, and then in 2011, uh, 2007 he moved to uh, ETH Zurich where he also completed a PhD in mechanical engineering uh, actually supervised by uh, our co-chair uh, of this conference, Patrick Yeni. Um, he received, he did an excellent job as actually everything he does uh, but this was awarded by the ETH medal and after completing his PhD he moved uh, as a postdoctoral researcher uh, to Stanford University to work with uh, Hamdi Chalepi uh, for a little bit more than one year and then he uh, got a tenured position at Delft University of Technology. In between for three years he was a guest professor at the University of Stuttgart collaborating with, uh, collaborating with uh, Rainer Helmich. Um, and I, I started saying that Hadi needs no introduction, at least for the fervent, uh, fervent participants to this Interpol conference, because he was a co-chair, one of the two chairpersons of this conference for three editions. So he did really a great job. We are all thanks, thankful for him, to him. Um, he received many uh, awards, distinctions. Also, he was successful in acquiring grants. Um, so I'm just restricting myself to saying that He's also the awardee of uh, the Interpol Award uh, for Poros Media Research this year. He also received an, an Interpol Rosette. Hadi has an expertise in modeling and simulation of uh, processes in the subsurface, I mean here flow deformation, whatever. Um, and he's applying a lot of multi-scale methods in particular to fractured media. So before giving the word to Hadi, I should mention that it is not allowed, this, this uh, presentation is being recorded, so don't do it at home, it's not allowed. Um, and please, it is allowed and actually warmly recommended to ask questions, and you can do this uh, either via the chat or the Q&A uh, and raising hands. Um, so thank you very much, Hadi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sorin, for this very nice and kind introduction. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this talk. Uh, I'm going to present, uh, as Sorin mentioned, our research uh, around uh, hydrogen uh, underground storage, uh, which is a part of a project at TU Delft called Admire. The work is presented by me, but obviously and certainly not just my work, plenty colleagues have contributed and uh, helped me shape this talk today. To start off with the subject, let me remind all of us that larger scale energy storage is a crucial component to achieve and stay living in a green world. Supply of renewable energy is intermittent by nature, and so storage of energy is a key factor to secure a green world uh, for us. And to give you a perspective of what do I mean by large scale, let's look into how much energy do we consume. In country scale consumption of energy, we are uh, demanding for several terawatt hour of energy per year. In the country Netherlands, where I live, with about 16 million residents, uh, we consume about 800 terawatt hour in total of energy. And obviously different countries have different scale of consumption. So how can we store energy 
for this massive scale of consumption. One way that comes to mind to store energy is by electricity-based uh, batteries, where you can store it in electricity form. An electrical vehicle battery, which is quite capable of storing a lot of energy, has the scope of the order of 100 kilowatt hour. If you want to store the energy required for the country Netherlands for one year, you would need 8 billion Tesla car batteries to store only for Netherlands. Even a portion of the year, a season would be, or a quarter would be still a massive scale. So they are not really feasible for large scale storage. So how else can we store energy? Energy can be converted into different forms that would allow us to reach the capacities which we are interested in. Obviously, the discharge time, the time that takes to take it and reclaim it, could also be affected as we go beyond the scope of kilowatt hour scale electricity based batteries. Specifically for the talk of today, I am focusing on hydrogen, which can be produced through electrolysis uh, and using renewable energy have electrolysis through electrochemistry, you can produce green hydrogen. There with one cubic meters of hydrogen, you can store a little bit above the Tesla car battery. So if you want to store it in green gas form like hydrogen, then you would be in room temperature 50 bars, you can keep in one cubic meter, as I said, 130 kilowatt hour of energy. So that would just translate the question or challenge into different form. Where would you store massive amount of volumes of gas? Not massive amount of Tesla car batteries. Now here, gas. There we go to subsurface formations, geosciences, where you go below the surface, depending on where you would go to utilize, you can store it in giant subsurface formations to hold your energy in form of green gas. This may look quite straightforward, but the science behind it is not really very straightforward. Let me set the objectives here. You go below the subsurface of the planet Earth, depending on where you end, whether in salt rock depositions, where you can do solution mining and create cavities, uh, salt caverns, or you could go to utilize porous rocks, depleted gas reservoirs or aquifers, the objective here is cyclically storing your green gas and getting it back when you need energy. In surplus, store it when you need energy, get it, take it back. So in a cyclic manner, you would like your highly mobile hydrogen gas compressed, be contained fully inside the reservoir. You want to produce it fully pure with the same purity that's the objective as the injection phase so you're going to take it back because you need it and if you add impurities you would increase the cost of filtration and other processes afterwards and you would like to operate the system below the critical stress in a cyclic manner we have been using subsurface formations for a long time so far we know for all applications that we have been working with, subsurface formations are multi-scale in nature, heterogeneous, fractured, faulted, could be. The data that we have about them is always incomplete with the advancements of geophysical steel surveys. Still, we are by large extent uncertain about them, but the blue parts are actually common in many applications. What are the additional complexities related to cyclic utilization of subsurface for green gas storage? There we have cyclic transport and mechanics, which makes these applications a little bit more complex scientifically. And plus the fact that hydrogen is a new gas. It stays in a compressed gas stage, which is quite mobile and it's very tiny. As we know, hydrogen is the tiniest molecule. Compare it with CO2 storage. There we have been doing a lot of research on CO2, there are a lot of commonalities in here, but cyclicity compared to monotone 
And purity is what makes hydrogen quite different, apart from the fact that hydrogen and CO2 are quite different fluids. Hydrogen remains gas, CO2 stays supercritical. So there you want to do a lifetime storage of CO2, but here you want to do just simply a, a, a cyclicity, so you need to keep the purity also contained. There are several, several scientific activities to make this entire program of hydrogen on the ground storage a successful project. Here I'm going to target and focus mainly on hydrodynamics and geomechanics. For the purity, for example, microbiological aspects are very important as well because H2S, uh, hydrogen sulfide, should be prevented to be created in the soft surface and other things. But I, I am going to only focus on these two aspects. But the scope of the science is much beyond the two aspects that I'm going to go through. Let me take you to the path of field development projects for, for example, CO2 storage. What do we do typically in geosciences? We know that the physics takes place in micro scale, but the observation and operation happens in kilometer scale. There is a large gap of a scale in terms of time and space and physics. What we typically do is we focus on poor scale, micro scale to understand the process, find upscale constitutive laws, construct our dynamic systems, and then do uncertainty quantification and collect field data and re, uh, reduce our uncertainty about the surface. We have done that about the surface, subsurface. We have done that for CCS projects. And many, many great geoscientists have contributed in understanding the poor scale processes of CO2, then constructing heterogeneous complex physical models for CO2 and be able to do dynamic multiscaling and understanding what the lifetime storage of different types from residual dissolution and structural will happen, but all based on correct understanding of microscale and then do some computational advancement, advancements or model all the reductions to understand the process security and efficiency. I am here to claim that hydrogen storage should go the same way. Why would I do that? Why would I emphasize that? It looks like to be a trivial task to many of you, that when you go to the literature, you could take a simulator and then do hydrogen storage, a feasibility study. But yeah, you can do that and we need to do that and they're very important, but with what input data? Imagine I wanna construct my simulator and want to study technical feasibility. What do I do in the interface between hydrogen, for example, with reservoir brine? Where should I start with this? When you go to the literature, this has not been done rigorously in a way that we have seen ad hoc input functions because there were no existing experiments. And so modelers started with the best knowledge of the time to do technical feasibilities. We found a core flood experiment the time that we started at my project 2019, which actually was about receding contact angle of hydrogen brine sandstone was reported 21 degrees, which was very high from what we could see. And so we started to do some poor scale sensitivity analysis to see, can we just get a good first base of what the functions should look like? Leila is going to give a talk on 4th of June, please do attend. And we learned a lot of good things about this process when we look into micro scale, just modeling process processes. We found that the process is hysteretic, obviously. Contact angle and digital rock information is very important. And so we had to do sensitivity analysis around the baseline of the reported experiment at that time. So to understand what are the sensitivities with respect to different poor scale structures. But then what comes here is that, what is the contact angle? And so we went to the lab. We created hydrogen lab in Delft. So to have a captive bubble cell here and to release gas at in situ condition, understand, its contact angle. We did that here. You see the image of the bubbles can be seen here. We did that for nitrogen first to make sure that we can correctly cap, you know, calculate and measure, not calculate, I'm sorry, measure the directly the intrinsic contact angle of the gas. And we did match with the literature data perfectly. So now we can say, let's release hydrogen. We did release hydrogen at elevated pressures up to 100 bars, temperatures 50 degrees of centigrade, 
different pressure, different salinity of the brine, different pressures. We started to look into bubbles of hydrogen and then see over time, what would be the bubble size and the contact time. And we did the averaging analysis, reported all the data and found that the hydrogen Intrinsic contact angle is with, between about 25 to 40 degrees, which would correspond with morose function to receding angle of about one to five, not 21, in the porous, in this bubble scale, and a static one. So our results were very different from core flood, but then made a lot more sense to actually work with them. Obviously, this is an ongoing research. We are trying now to do dynamic angles and not we. There are other groups that are working on the same subject as well. So benchmarking of all our understandings on the subject of this cyclic transport at micro scale all the way to core flood would make a lot of sense here to understand how can we uh, 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 characterize the cyclic transport and hysteretic nature of this storage process. Vaus is going to present this again this Friday afternoon uh, about the detailed processes that we have gone through in order to, uh, to characterize the static contact angle of hydrogen. So that was about hydrodynamics. You could do your simulation, but you need an input data. You need proper understanding of the poor scale physics. And so to experiment and advance, not only just modeling part, but also the experiments as well. How about rock mechanics? When you look into the reservoir engineering practices, many times we are working with poroelasticity. Cyclic loading motivates plastic deformation. And there's no linear line of a stress a strain. What you would see in the lab would be a lot more complex than a straight line. So you would have elasticity, but plasticity of different forms of nonlinear and also time dependent, which would mean that you can't really rely only on elastic rock mechanics part. And it is like hysteretic, like the fluid mechanics part. So if you go to this, Plastic deformation analysis for cyclic loading, you would see that you have total strain, total deformation to be the elastic part plus all the deviations from the elastic one. From creep, which is a time dependent plastic deformation to thermoplasticity and viscoplasticity. Okay, so then your linear momentum balance should actually be nonlinear because then you have all these nonlinear plastic information, you just subtract from the total the red parts and then know that elastic part is linearly proportional to, to uh, symmetric gradient of displacement. So you end up with this form, which actually you would go to experiments to get the, and also the models where you have different models to understand what are different forms of these creep, thermoplasticity and viscoplasticity. There you have parameters to tune. And what we did was to get the best available experiments to tune A and M, for example, in this case, to match the experiments observed. So to use not just ad hoc functions or parameters, but somehow try to match the experiments that are available. There we could match the first cycles, but far from that, we deviated from it. So we could not match with the existing formulations, all the cycles that were available. And as you see, as you go further in the cycles, you deviate, but still not too far. Okay, now with that, we went on and put this cyclic, let's say in this case, creep into the reservoir scale model to see what would it mean that when you keep the pressure of your cavern at some constant, but you see that over time, it changes its shape. Or when you see that subsidence at time zero is this curve, but after 10 years, it would have more subsidence because it has plastic deformation, which is time dependent. And so we could, quantify now what would be the impact of plasticity over a long time of, of a storage in cyclic manner. Now done with the hydrodynamics and mechanics. A lot is still yet to be done, but just addressing the two. Now with these nonlinear hysteretic functions of highly heterogeneous formations, you have coupled processes that are global, like pressure, stress deformation, you have local components in your system which are highly coupled, and you have fast processes, slow processes, and so all of them are there. And you need to have a good strategy for modeling and simulation, which is as important as getting also the proper input data from lab with the poor scale based studies. And there, 
you would see that existing at the time, multi-scale strategies were very, very helpful in the entire community of computational science, but not complete in a way that it would just bring you with one answer about what to do with this process. So what we tried to contribute in the community was to develop an ADM method, which would stand for adaptive dynamic multi-level method to capture all these coupling processes, the slow fast, heterogeneous, heterogeneous properties and so on. In a brief manner, what is that idea? We know that there is a big development and quite rich in adaptive mesh refinements, where the local processes are being looked at the front very precisely, far from the front with coarse mesh. Now, you would see that in this geoscience application, we reversed the process and said, let's do dynamic coarsening. We start from fine scale geological structure and try to coarsen it dynamically where we don't have much front or steep gradients. So then the challenge here becomes that it is coupled with a global component, which is pressure or a stress fit or deformation fit, meaning that even if you go to coarse grid here, you can't just do no smart way of uh, multi-scale modeling in general, either homogenization or basis function based multi-scaling with the entire system. Messing up here in one of the course blocks, it's a global system pressure would be affected everywhere almost. And then you would see that the front also would be affected by that because it's depending on the quality of your pressure and velocity field everywhere. So that's why we uh, took the idea of the you know, multi-scale modeling that I have been also working the past decade on that subject as well, put it into dynamic system and multi-level system. So you would calculate for each local cell with some coarse nodes to be selected, locally computed basis functions in a multi-level set. You have fractures, you would also take that into account too. And recently we have done a, a benchmarking for that study that is also interesting for being a study. And then we put it all into an algebraic framework where you would do everything algebraically so you would allow yourself to do uncertainty quantification as well uh, in the fine scale system properties too. And now with these things, let me just present the final results for now getting these nonlinear functions into modeling. Here is the multi-phase flow and heat transfer where you have embedded fractures and so you can actually do local basis functions for matrix and fracture in different levels, once only at the beginning of the simulation. There you can capture fractures, heterogeneities, and everything else. But also it would allow you to do local time stepping where you can advance your front faster, but in multiple steps, and then match the rest of the simulator and be conservative in this multi-level system. The collaboration, this work was in collaboration with Politecnico Milano's colleague as well. And finally, how about the including the mechanics, the cyclic mechanics from the cyclic loading that you may remember? We could match with the multi-scale strategies of this basis function type in the full cycle of the fine scale. These are coming from experiments. And in time passing by from zero to 10 years of creep analysis, we could now capture it also with using extremely simple linear-based shape functions. And with that, let me conclude my talk. In summary, subsurface formations are giant batteries for renewable gas. The process is cyclic and hydrogen is a new gas. Data for experiment still is lacking, so the chain is no stronger than its weakest link. So experiments and pore skin analysis plays a very key role here, as well as simulation and modeling. The lessons we have learned so far is that the ad hoc functions better to be now resolved and go to the lab and get the meaningful results. Our results at the bubble scale, we differ from the core-based, core core flood-based experiments. And the matching of the mechanics with cyclic process with the existing formulas were okay uh, for the first uh, cycles, not far. And Professor Chlaternik is giving also an invited talk this conference. He's a, a, an expert in geomechanics. I'm looking forward to his talk as well to see the advancements in the field. And from fine to field, many multi-scale strategies are developed and we have also contributed by ADM to make the fully implicit multi-scale and dynamic multi-level because with hydrogen, you need to capture the front very accurately. And this is an extremely important subject. 
and a lot to be done yet. And I hope we, this would keep us quite busy and many others uh, who are attending this conference as well. And uh, to thank you all for your uh, um, attendance and listening, though I could not see you. I wish I could see you in the real life, in, in the real room, but I hope that you could take some useful message from this talk. Uh, I should thank a lot of people, including also recently these colleagues who uh, graciously made this uh, achievement to be happening. Still, we are looking for two more postdocs to join. If you're interested in finishing your PhD, please do uh, contact us. Thanks a lot. And I do take the questions. Thank you very much, Hadi, for this nice presentation. You were really on time. So this, this explains also why the conferences, previous conferences were so well organized, getting <laughs> everything well planned. Um, of course, the floor is open for questions, which uh, I see no hand, right? OK, I see one question coming. Please, uh, uh, please unmute yourself. I'm not sure whether I can do it. Uh, uh, Anwar Kachimov. Ah, yeah, I gave you the permission to talk. Can you? Can Anwar? you hear me? Yeah, yeah yes, we hear we you perfect, me. please. Please ask your question. Hello. No, Anwar? Uh, okay, I, it seems you have a technical issue. Please, the next, uh, Shubani, Palvar. Hi, sir. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we do. Please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Hadi, sir, for this amazing presentation. So, I had this doubt that, uh, as we know that for CO2 storage under Earth, uh, we need to store it in supercritical condition. So, I wanted to ask that for hydrogen, do we uh, know the temperature and pressure at which it can be stored? Oh, that's a, a great question. Thank you very much for, for asking. Uh, there are different uh, subsurface formations that you would, uh, you would look into, like salt caverns, and obviously the pressure there would be different than porous rocks and, and, deep, and aquifers. We are yes. thinking about 100 to 200 bars of pressure. Okay. If I want to do just be very, uh, um, yeah, first order uh, thing would be that, but obviously depending on the structure that you have, you, you cannot exceed a certain pressure because of mechanical stability. And you cannot be lower than a specific pressure because, again, the same reason. But we are thinking about 100 to 200 bars or maybe okay. 250 or so. But this is the range that it would give you give you a good sense. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Of course. Thank Pleasure. You. Majid, please. Thank you very much for the question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Majid, please. please go on. Okay, great. Thank you, Majid, for a very nice talk, as always. I, have, I know very little about hydrogen properties. I wondered what are mechanisms that could cause lots of hydrogen? Are there any mechanisms that the hydrogen can dissolve into uh, resistance to it, interact with anything? What is going about? Majid, your voice was coming very uh, low in yes. the quality. I, I guess uh, what I, from what I heard is that your question is about the advancement in the production of hydrogen and the scaling up so that we have this much of hydrogen. So. No, is I that, meant, is that, can you hear me now? Yes, we do, a, a little yeah, bit okay. better. But, yeah. I, mean, I meant that, are there any mechanisms that when you inject the hydrogen off surface, that you lose hydrogen, the solution in hydrogen fluid, in fraction, so any other Absolutely. Mechanism? That's a, that's a great question. So for those who could not hear magic well, the question is about containment of hydrogen in the subsurface and the processes that would enhance losing hydrogen. Hydrogen in the subsurface with the high pressure, even 100 bars or 200 bars, remains compressed gas. It's not like CO2, which is super critical at this stage and then becomes almost half of dense of the brine. So here you have highly mobile hydrogen, which is tiny and so it can leak uh, easily, much easier than CO2 would do. So the processes that would uh, enhance the leakage would be just the high mobility. Mixing of hydrogen with Cushion gas would be another major factor of, of, uh, of losing its purity. And one other thing that I mentioned was about geochemistry and microbiology. There are bacterial activities that would 
um, uh, microbial activities that would enhance creation of H2S hydrogen sulfide depending on the temperature, pressure, and the composition of the subsurface. And especially for uh, salt caverns, uh, this study is, has been done. We have done a little bit of work on that subject as well. And there is also a, a, a major problem here to quantify how much bacterial activities and, and microbial activities and uh, with geochemistry would have. So that depending on how long you would keep hydrogen in the subsurface before it's being produced and with what fluids at what uh, rock condition it is being in contact with and what cushion gas, you would see that you would lose purity if you don't uh, manage it well. Um, and there are many uh, projects running and I did not list them all. There are many projects running in globally and uh, to study and quantify in the lab even also this uh, microbiological uh, activities at the pore scale. So to quantify at what conditions we could lose the purity. But this is a great subject of research and we are interested and we are working on this. Uh, allow me because we, I think we have to stay oh, on time, but still to read one question because I think Professor Kachimov didn't manage to, 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 yes. to mention it. It was posted in, 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 in the quick Q&A in the chat. Uh, how do you show three cycles for large number of cycles, will the process become cycle stationary? Uh, oh, this is an effect. amazing question. I'm great that you, you, have, you have asked. <laughs> I don't know. The answer is in the lab. So we are, we are looking into the lab experiments to observe and very, very nicely, uh, 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 Dr. Kachimov, uh, the thing is that cyclic experiments relevant for the cyclicity of long time storage of green gas. We are not talking about one year, two years. We are talking about several decades of cyclic loading is not, ex doesn't exist much in the literature. And so it's a big uh, 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 request for rock mechanics experimentalists to quantify this process in the lab so that we can tune our model parameters and use them. And there is also another question whether the existing formulas describing the plasticity uh, is also valid or we need to even revise those as well. So these are all the uh, exciting challenges in front of uh, Interpore Society and the Poros Media Science Society. And it's quite exciting because it will make us even busier than we used to be. So thank you very much. That's, uh, so, and also thank you for this question to Professor yes. Kachimov. Uh, so that's, uh, and actually I would like to thank everyone who actively participated. Unfortunately, we don't have time to answer all the questions. They are in the chat. I encourage you to contact Hadi. I know he's happy to answer questions oh, to receive questions to answer. He's looking for questions, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, I also will ask mine uh, later. So by this, I would like to thank the audience uh, who attended to, and in, uh, to give an applause to everyone and in particular to Hadi for delivering such a very nice talk. Thank and let me express much. Much the gratitude to the organizers who did a, such a great job. Um, amazing bring job. Us together. Yeah. Absolutely. In, in, thank in, you all. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.